The title of today's message is Upside Down, and I'd like us to start in Exodus chapter 1, so if you've got a Bible and uh, can turn there with us, then uh, find Exodus chapter 1, and we'll move from left to right as much as possible and uh, see what the book says. It's very fascinating to me if you look back through history, um, you have times when there's legitimate injustice, whatever, you, whatever it is, legitimate injustice. And people rise up and say, something needs to change, something needs to happen. But inevitably, even in this country for decades, um, inevitably, there are groups, subversive groups, that kind of hide out and wait. And they wait for an opportunity when a legitimate concern is raised They jump in with a Marxist, socialist, communist, uh, whatever it is, uh, approach and say, this is our opportunity to create chaos, incite violence, make problems, and completely hijack the injustice that was being addressed. And what is so fascinating to me about that thing that happens and people that are trained in that, and this, this is not something you just know how to do naturally. There are people that, that are trained to go into a country, a culture, a society, and they know when to do, what they need to do, and, and what is so fascinating about it to me is it doesn't take many people. Uh, in, our, in the discipleship book that we use, our, our buddy John Tolson, Four Priorities, he cites an example and they ask Fidel Castro how many people it took to bring about the revolution in Cuba. And he said about 70 people. And then he then asked him a very interesting thing. Said, if you did it again, how many would it take? And he said, maybe three or four, but they'd have to be willing to die. So the power of a small number of people completely, totally sold out, committed, even unto death for their cause, You can do a lot of damage, but you can also do a lot of good. Now, let's start in Exodus chapter 1. I got these things printed, and I I don't have time to read all of this, so I do encourage you to go back and read this stuff because there's some tremendous stories. And here's another thing I want to caution you against. Once I say Exodus chapter 1 and I start reading, you go, oh, I already know that story. Uh, If you know that story, then quote the chapter. You can't quote the chapter usually, and there are things that you miss because you think, I already know the story, and there are things in that story God may be wanting to speak to you. So Exodus chapter 1, now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All those who were descendants of Jacob were, were 70 persons. That's it. For Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation, but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us. And so go out and so go up out of the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh's supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. In other words, hard, hard, hard labor. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one Shiphrah and the name of the other Puah, and he said, now I'm about to read you some crazy stuff, but I want you to think in terms of our own country when you hear this and when I say this. This is what he says to the midwives. These are the women that go out and deliver the babies of the Israelites. When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see that on the birth stools it is a son, then you shall kill him. And if it is a daughter, then you shall, 
then, then she shall live. You say, well, what kind of nutcase king or pharaoh or leader would say something like that? You don't have to go far. You don't have to leave our country. Forget wait until they're born to kill them. We're moving to that. I mean, we're getting more sophisticated. We're killing them before they're even born. Now, this is one of these things people say, I'm done with you, you get political. Let me tell you something about abortion. There's nothing political about abortion. And this is how I process this stuff. I, you know, we, we, we look back over 400 years of our own history, and we say slavery, oppression, it's a nightmare, it's, it's evil, it's terrible. And we look back on that and go, wow, we got, we got to fix these things. We can't allow for these things. we got to have just people being people, everyone treated equally, right? We all, we, we, I think we all agree on that, I hope. And I'm wondering how long it's going to take, so you're going to have to follow me a minute, if I am here looking back at 400 years of that, how far in the future am I going to have to go, or are we going to have to go as a country, before we look back at right now and say, what were those crazy people thinking killing 40, 50, 60 million unborn children? Amen. Where's the outcry going to be? Where's the generation that will be born and go, had they lost their mind? Was slavery not enough that then someone came up with a brilliant idea of killing the unborn? You think, oh, you're making us nervous. You should be nervous. You live in a country that allows this mess. So while we're cleaning things up, why don't we address atrocities across the board? Because what kind of injustice is that for those little kids that don't get born? I met a man in a restaurant just the other day, waiting on our table. And he, I said, where are you from? Oklahoma. Uh, mom and dad, yeah. Mom's, I think he said, my mom's white, my dad's black. We talked about that a little bit, and I said, well, how long have they been married? He said, they never were married. Great guy, great conversation. I said, whoa, whoa, I said, let me, let me just do something. I said, I don't know you very well, and this is very intense conversation already. I said, will you do me a favor? When you see your mom, you talk to your mom, whatever your relationship with her, will you tell her that a man in a restaurant that you waited on said to tell her how proud I am of her and grateful to her that she kept you? Because whatever the circumstances were around your birth, they weren't married, whatever, there, there's plenty of women saying, I'm going to fix it. And I'm not trying to be insensitive to people who have made this decision. I allow for that. There's mercy, grace, forgiveness. Um, but this is very expensive stuff. Now you say, well, what happened in Egypt? What should be happening anywhere in the world? Keep reading here with me. So if it's a boy, kill it. If it's a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. Where are those people? Like, I don't care what he says. I'm not killing these babies. The midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt, this is literally the king going, what's going on down there? Called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? Now, they have a brilliant answer. That's why you, if you don't read your Bible, you miss all this humor. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. They're having these babies so fast, we can't even get there to deliver them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mightily. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people. Now it gets even crazier. He commands all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. You say, well, how do you even live in a culture like that? Let me tell you how you live in a culture like that or this. You speak. You act. You do something already. You, if, if, you don't, if you say, well, our country's going you know, downhill, down the toilet, whatever, then do something about it. You say, well, what can little old me do? Look at Cuba. Look at Venezuela. Look at anywhere you want to look in the world where a, bunch, a handful of people turn the place upside down. You say, well, I don't think that's possible. With God, anything is possible. And what really infuriates me is the world has tools and, and ideas that do not work. And this sermon is not about 
our republic and about democracy. It is a great form of government, but it is not the answer to the world's problems. Being, a, being an American will not get you into heaven. Being a, in a democratic society will not, that doesn't mean you make heaven. It may have some benefits if all those benefits are applied to all the people, but it's not perfect. Jesus is perfect. His plan is perfect. Give people his plan. That will change the world. You say, well, how many of us does it take? I'll read you some more stories about this. So keep reading this one. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as his wife, uh, took a wife, a daughter of, of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. What was she told to do? Throw him in the river. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. So technically, they didn't say you couldn't put the baby in a boat in the river. Right? So she gets creative. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Now, I can't, even, I can't even get my, I mean, that's why you can't, if you read your Bible, you have to slow down. How is a mother, do you have a baby, he's a beautiful child, he's your child, you're told to throw him in a river and, and watch him drown, because he's not going to be able to swim, the crocodiles, whatever, are going to eat him, and he, it's over. And that's what you're told to do. And so you say, well, I can't do that. I'm going to hide him. And you say, well, now I've got to put him in the river. I can't hide him anymore. And you've got his, little, his, his big sister watching what's going to happen to him. What's going to happen to him? This is just, just mind-bogglingly painful, stressful, fearful situation. So keep reading. Um, laid him in the reeds. And his sister stood afar off. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. Thank God Moses wept, because what that trigger? So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. She knew it by looking at him. Then, her, then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Happened to be there available and knew someone that had breast milk. So what a, what a, what a miracle. What a, what a coincidence. Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Not, not his mother. I can find someone that could nurse this baby. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away. So gives Moses back to the mom. Take this child away, nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses. Anybody know why his name was Moses? It wasn't because his mama named him Moses. Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses because I drew him out of the water. And that's what the word meant. Now, why do I read you these stories? Because these are individual people who made single decisions that were against the grain. These midwives, Moses' mom, they are making decisions that can cost them their life, but they say, you know what? If it costs me my life, it'll cost me my life. I cannot allow this to go on. And that's the kind of people who have changed the world. Just go immediately to Jesus. Great, he's a great teacher. We've had plenty of those. Great, he claimed a bunch of stuff, did miracles, great. What he was willing to do was... was was give his very life to accomplish the goal, which is what was required. And he dies, and that way we live. Go to Daniel chapter 3. Gosh, these stories are too long. You've got to go read them. Please take notes and go read these stories again, even if you've read them, because I can't, I can't get into all of this. King Nebuchadnezzar, this guy's a king over a massive kingdom. He decides he wants to build this massive statue, call in all his people, get them to the base of this statue, surround this statue, and, and when the music plays, everybody's got to bow down. So he brings them all in, and that's what goes down. Uh, but there were, some, there were some Jewish people who were captured and taken into exile, and here they are with Nebuchadnezzar, and they ain't, they're, not, they're, they're not biting, okay? Now let me tell you something about these situations. 
you better know what you're about before you get in the situation. Or if you're in the situation, you, you will have a, an almost impossible time deciding to do the right thing. The reason prayer and scripture are so important is you get by yourself with God, you see what the scripture says, you hash these things out with him, then when you get in the public, you get in the, in the, in the arena where it's live bullets, you don't have to go, ooh, what do I believe about that? You go, I know exactly what I believe about that. We're not playing this game. And you speak the truth in love. You say, well, they're going to shoot back. I don't care. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't say these things casually like, okay, well, what's the, what's the worst thing that could happen to me? Well, you would think the worst thing that could happen to me for preaching the truth is that I would be killed. That's the best thing that could happen for me. Get martyred? Well, I think you get more points for that or something. I've got to read those verses again, but, you know, wow, that's bada bing, bada boom. I got martyred, right? Now, that sucks for me until I'm dead, then I don't care because I'm in heaven. My family's going to go, ah, he spoke the truth and now, you know, he's gone, Probably not all bad in all situations, but, um, you know, it's a tough thing. So he said, well, you seem so cavalier about that. I'm not afraid to die. I don't want to be tortured and, you know, my toenails pulled out or some crazy thing. But, you know, once you're dead, you're dead, and, and I'm going to heaven. Well, what if they persecute you? They don't kill you. Okay. This book is full of these verses. I'm always stunned. People say, oh, well, they're being mean to me. I'm like, dude, what, what Bible are you reading? Well, I was told if I trusted Jesus, and you have to say it right, I trusted Jesus, that I would be happy. And, and people would be nice to me. They're not going to be nice to you. They hated him. They're going to hate you. They persecute you. him. They persecute you. But the Bible is also replete with verses about the joy that comes from being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Amen. So we're not out there trying to make trouble. And I'll read you some of these in a minute. So he erects this statue. Not every, everybody bows because if you don't, the consequence will you'll be killed. And, and it wasn't just we'll shoot you or you know, hit you over the head with a hammer. He thought up a really great idea. We'll have this fiery furnace and we'll throw people in the furnace. So the threat is extreme. You do this or this. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's see where's jumping here. And they say no. Ah, verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, is it true? Now, he's, he is furious, and you'll see how he goes from furious to something else in a minute. He is furious. Is it true? Like gives him a chance that you do not serve my gods and worship the, the gold image which I've set up. Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the, the horn, flute, harp, and all these, all the, you know, the symphony, call down and fall down and worship the image which I've made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the fiery, to the burning fiery furnace. And then ask the question. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands as though he is God and has an image that he can tell everybody to worship? You have to know the answers to these questions. And when they come up, you've got to be able to say, you know what? This is what I'm going to say. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, very respectfully, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Now, you know, what does he mean by that? Either way, he's either going to deliver us out of the fire, or he's going to deliver us in the fire into his presence. But he will deliver us from you either way. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And he flipped his lid. Throw them in the fire. Heat it up even hotter if that's possible. They throw these guys in the fire. Um, and they're all looking in the fire. Go down to verse uh, uh, 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his, his counselors, I thought, we, I thought we threw three guys in. Did we not cast th three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he, said, he answered, I see four men loose 
walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Servants of the Most High God. Now he's saying it. Come out and come here. And they came out. The, 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 there's not, they didn't even smell like smoke. Hair not singed, nothing. And the guys that threw them in died throwing them in. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word. And yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. That is a powerful verse. They frustrated the king's words. They yielded their bodies they have, and that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Is that me? Is that you? Now these are slaves, basically, that are given responsibility. They're the prize capture. And they come in here, and before it's all over, they're telling a king what's up, and everything changes. Keep reading. Therefore, I make a decree. He's already made one decree. He's making another one. That any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Amen. Then the king prompt promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Give God a chance to show up. Amen. My gosh. Take a stand. What's well, going to cost me? Okay, let's see what it costs you. It may not cost you anything. Because if a few idiots can show up and turn the country upside down, what if a few Christians said, you know what, we're not playing this game anymore. The answer is not America. The answer is Jesus. And we're tired of sitting on our hands and on our butts and not doing anything. What is... We are waiting for the culture. We're waiting for the society. The, somebody else is going to lead. The church of the living God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, is supposed to lead on the planet and show people things that are impossible without God. All right, go to Daniel, uh, we'll get some more Daniel in here. Go to Daniel chapter uh, 6. Another great story. And by the way, these guys all came into this at the same time. Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Azariah, uh, Mishael, they changed their name to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, Daniel, powerful, powerful, powerful in this kingdom. And the governors, go down to verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could, not, they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. They had nothing on him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. The only place we're going to entrap him is in his relationship and in his law to his God. So they start looking about some, con some consistency, not inconsistency, in his relationship with God. So they dream this up. They know that he is going to pray no matter what. So they come up with some scheme. They go to the king and say, hey, let's have a deal that for so many days nobody can pray to anybody else, blah, 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 and make it according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. Why? Because that could not be reversed. The, even the king could not reverse a decree like that that he had made. So they make the degree, and, and if, and if uh, everybody doesn't comply, whoever gets caught gets thrown in the lion's den. Brilliant. Verse 8, now, O king, establish a decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Uh, therefore, King Darius signed the, the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew, now look at this, when he knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And what did he do? And in his upper room, with the windows open toward Jerusalem. I ain't hiding. You can have whatever you want to have signed. This is how you're going to trap me. I'm not changing it. You can trap me. Windows open toward Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. 
Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast in the, the, the den of lions? And he said, well, yeah. And he said, well, Daniel. Now let me tell you what's interesting about Daniel. Daniel does not close all the windows and go, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And skip a day. Right. The thing signed. He goes home and does exactly what he has always done. When you get in a groove with God, you're not changing your groove because somebody says something. Don't be a wishy-washy believer that just because some woke person comes up with some new nonsense, you go, oh, well, maybe that's true. Why don't you know what the truth is? And when you hear something that's not true, you go, that's not true. They go, oh, well, you're just going to get left behind. Well, I'll go left behind and right behind, dude. I'm not going with you. It's another joke I've been working on, but we'll, we'll leave that for another day. So what happens? Uh, where's the verse that says the, the, um, the king's upset? He realizes what they've done to him. Now, this king's upset too, but watch this. Verse 16, uh, so the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him in the den of lions. But the king spoke saying to Daniel, now look at what this king says to Daniel. Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. The king has faith in Daniel's God because he knows Daniel. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords. Then the purpose concerning Daniel, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. <laughs> you think this king didn't love Daniel? And no musicians were brought before him, and his, also his sleep went from him. Then the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of the lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. So tragedy in this voice. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, now imagine hearing those words out of a lion's den that's been sealed, and you've cried out hoping your, your friend hears you, and then the first words you hear are, O king. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury, whatever, was found on him because he believed in his God. So the king was exceedingly glad for Daniel. He was not exceedingly glad for the people who trapped Daniel. And the king <coughs> gave the command, that, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Then the king Darius, then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages who dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion in my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, specifically Daniel's God. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You say, well, wow, that's just stuff in the Bible. It's not limited to just stuff in the Bible. One person in one country who takes a stand and, and pushes back. And people say, well, we shouldn't be involved in politics and in the government. It's impossible not to be. 
How are you going to take a stand for Jesus and sooner or later the culture, the people who hate God and hate Jesus specifically, are not going to come against you? Uh, you may have seen the other day a CNN reporter came out and, and you, know, you just feel bad for these guys and, and you say, Whoa, pray for these people. Comes out and says, well, Jesus wasn't perfect. Right? And uh, Tony Dungy, NFL coach, former coach, comes out and says, you're wrong. Now, he didn't blast, the, and I'm not even saying the guy's name on CNN because I'm not trying to throw anybody in the bus. The guy just revealed who and where he is. You cannot be a Christian unless Jesus is perfect. Small technicality. <laughs> I, I don't need an almost perfect Jesus, Mr. Nice Guy, hanging on a cross for me. I need perfection. Lamb of God, without spot, blemish, I need that. So, a guy like Tony Dungy comes out and calls that comment out. Well, he'll get blasted. You know what? Who cares? How are you not, not going to call that out? Now, we're not throwing that, the guy who said it under the bus. We're just saying, that's not true. Now you've crossed too many lines. Now you're messing with my Jesus. And I will not sit by when you mess with my Jesus. Because he died for me, and now he's saying to me, you want to follow me? Then, then you've got to be willing to take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. You, you want to you save your life? You're going to lose it. You want to you find your life? You'll lose it for my sake? Boom, there you go. Okay, I'm willing to lose my life to find it. And you know what happens when you lose your life to find it? You find it. And you say, well, how does that work? Well, somebody persecutes you and says something, you go home and go, wow, God, I finally got a piece of it. Somebody was mean to me for no other reason, but I defended you, I spoke up for you, and told them that that wasn't true. And then there's tremendous joy. Now, I'm not, again, not going to say this guy's name, but I wasn't praying for this guy before. Now I really know where he is. I need to pray for him, because he's hurting. Because if Jesus isn't perfect, we got nobody. We got nobody. Muhammad wasn't perfect. You can't, you can't name a religious leader who claims to be God, to come from God, who came down here and lived a sinless life to die on a cross, be buried, raised from the dead to save us. There isn't anybody else. So we lose Jesus, we're in big trouble. That's why you take a stand for Jesus. Because the world doesn't understand if they trash Jesus and he, he can't do it, they have no hope. Um, go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and let's do verse 10, 11, and 12. Uh, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. You say, well, it's not true. Okay, again, well, read your Bible. Well, they're lying about me. That's how they got Jesus killed. They lied about him. Well, that's not fair. You got to get off the it's not fair wagon. It's not fair. They should be nice to me. They hate us. They hate him. They're going to hate you. you. And this is where this goes, gets crazy. You figure that out without knowing it consciously or subconsciously. So you say, well, wait a minute. So they hate Jesus. If I associate myself with Jesus, they're going to hate me. I don't want to be hated. So I will disassociate myself from Jesus. Well, are you a Christian? Well, yeah, but I'm just trying to be real quiet about it so I don't make trouble for myself. If, if you're ashamed of me, then I'll be ashamed of you. It's all really so simple. You just got to count the cost and get on with it. And see, what you'll never know, what I will never know if I don't completely do this, is what could have happened. I'll get to heaven. I'll have my little in exit interview, entrance interview with Jesus, the Bema seat. 
and my life will be put to the fire and I will suffer loss. And I think in, that, in those moments, however long that takes, take a while for me, I'm sure, in, that, in those moments, I will probably see what could have been if I had trusted him. If I had not been chicken, if I had not been careful, if I had not been more concerned about me than him and other people. It's so fascinating to me that churches, it's all, and I'm, again, please don't ever misunderstand this. I am not against church buildings, but I'm not about, I'm, I am against building forts. Fort whatever. And so we build this fort, and we make it secure, and our people can come. And if you agree with us on every little nuance, out on the limb, you know, theological thing, you can be a part of our fort. And we're going to meet in the fort, and we're going to talk about our army, and then we're going to go out and not fight. And then we're going to get back together in the fort and see how it went. How'd it go? Well, what do you mean? Was it tough out there during the fight? What do you mean fight? I thought we were just raising money to have a cool fort. That you can't go to church. You got to be the church. And I equate church buildings to barns for sheep. They don't live in barns. You you may feed them and well, I don't want to say clip them because there's already too many Christians clipped. Um, you know, you take care of them, but the point is you're trying to get them back out to the pasture, out where they're supposed to be, out in the world to be salt and light. Just big fort salt. Like, you know, what are we, what are we doing? We're, we're storing, we're stockpiling salt. Get it out of here. Go be light. Go be what he said to be in the world. But they're going to shoot back. It's okay. You got a shield. The cool thing about that shield, by the way, it is a fire. It's not just a, an arrow stopping shield. It's got some kind of trick to it that when you get hit by a fiery dart, it not only stops the fiery dart, it has an extinguishing device that puts out the flame. So even if they hit you, and they don't miss, by the way, the devil does not miss, so you better get your shield up. If you're standing there holding your shield going boom, 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 and you're, you're on fire with the things of the world, put your shield up, it puts it out, you're going to be okay. And then you start going, okay, it's game on. It's game on. And we win. Forget the fort. We're only going back there when we have to. Let's get, let's get out here where the, where the battle is. Okay, let's read some more. Go to Acts chapter 16. Now, I, I, uh, I am not going to read you the last five or six chapters of Acts, but that's extraordinary. And it's really basically about Paul. And if you look, you know, we got half the New Testament written by Paul, one guy, um, and half the New Testament written to screwed up Christians. Right? Trying to get it right. And these guys, these individual people, under the power of the Holy Spirit, go into situations and wreak havoc on, on these, these places they go. So let's go to uh, Acts 16. Um, how much of this can I, can I read? They get arrested. Um, Okay, let's, let's go down here to verse 16. Now it happened, as we went to prayers, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us and uh, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaimed to us the way of salvation, and this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. 
Okay, so now he's gone from just preaching the gospel, cast out this demon, which is good for the girl, but not good for the people that owned her because they were making money off of this girl. And they, so they bring him in for the magistrates and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. You say, well, what in the world? I just tried to help a girl. Now I'm getting beaten within an inch of my life and I'm arrested. I didn't sign up for this. I I keep saying this to us. You did sign up for this. It's like people get married. Well, I didn't know I couldn't be selfish anymore. Well, I got to think about her now, her needs. It's about me. What? I didn't, I didn't say that at that ceremony. Read the fine print. It's all in there. I just got my little ticket to heaven. Please don't make me, don't don't tell me, don't teach me anything else. I I just want this. Just leave me alone with my ticket. Now you say, wow, that's a terrible thing that happened to them. Yes. But if you get past the terrible things that may or may not happen to us, and they may and they may not. We, ha- we don't live in a country where this is going on yet. We're probably getting close. And you're going to find out whether it's just a ticket or whether it's your life. So what, what is the outcome of this? He ends up in, in jail. They lock him down, and the jailer's terrified. And look at the jail story. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Well, they'd just been beaten to death almost. And now they're praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the the garrison of the prison were shaken, (coughs) and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, "Do, Do yourself no harm. We're all here. So what happens in that story? The, the jailer, his whole family, get saved, get baptized, and that's probably what it was all about. You go, well, I'm not getting beaten from some jailer. Then what are you going to do? Your life was worth him dying on a cross. What is someone else's life worth? Well, I don't want to make any sacrifices for someone else to make heaven. I've already made enough. What have you done? Who'd you die for? Nobody. So I keep talking about this. You have your little meeting with Jesus in the morning. Where, okay, here's what we're doing today, and I'm not telling you everything because some of this is going to be a little crazy. But you got to trust me. You're going to have this, you know, this, just trust me. You know, okay, I'm in. Whatever happens, I'm in. And you start going through your day, and crazy stuff starts happening, and you don't hesitate. You just keep going, and you go, oh, this is what you were talking about at our meeting this morning. Like, yeah, this is it. What are you going to do? I'll do whatever you say. It's going to be painful. Okay. And then you get through to the person that it was about and you look at them and you go, wow, you're the reason that I went through all this. This was to get to you. And they go, wow, thank you so much. Sorry about the beatings and all that. But man, I'm so glad you made it to me because now my whole life and eternity has been changed. They weren't nice to me. They're not going to be nice to that lost person in hell either. Now, I understand I'm not, I may get less and less takers because a lot of American Christians just want to be happy. Dude, I came to your church. I gave some money. Will you just leave us all the you-know-what alone? Like, whatever. I, you got verses. I know you got verses. We're not doing that. And if you don't stop, we're not going to give you any more money, and then you're going to be out of business. I don't care. Amen. I don't care. I sold mobile homes and put my way through college, right? I can sell mobile homes. It's hard, but I can do it. And, and even God lived in a mobile home for a long time, so I'm, don't be up on, on, on mobile homes. <laughs> Reference to the tabernacle in the Old Testament. I have to put asterisks in there for the non-humor people. Okay, so that was Acts 16. Quickly, let's do a little Acts 17. 
Uh, and this is so cool. All right, look at Acts um, 17.1. Now, when they had passed through Am- Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki, however you want to say it, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. You're waiting for Messiah? I'm telling you, he is the guy. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathered a, and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city. So we're not happy. We're jealous. We're going to get some guys we know that are troublemakers in the marketplace. We're going to Jason's house to find Paul and Silas. We don't or find Paul. We don't find them. So we'll take what we found. We'll take Jason. And this is what they accuse him of. Those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And the the world world there is the entire known world. These people, a handful if not individual people, have literally, now they're accusing them of turning the whole world upside down. Is anyone accusing me of that? Or is anyone accusing you of that? Are, you, are we even attempting anything where that could even be an accusation? Now, what were they doing? Preaching Jesus. What are we doing? Well, uh, I'm preaching Jesus. Where? When? What's your example? When's the last time you did it? Well, I'm not a preacher like you. You're not supposed to be like anybody else. You're supposed to be you where he puts you. And you are supposed to always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within you. And and I should be able, you should be able, and I should be able to go behind me. You should be able to go behind me. And I say, okay, this is where I was Monday all day, Tuesday all day, Thursday, whatever day. And go behind me and say, okay, tell me about your encounter with Pastor Ellis. Oh, he was mean. He was mean. That was a bad Monday. Forget Monday, Tuesday. So let's get your itinerary, and we're going to follow around. i got to be careful how I even explain this. I know a guy who is a believer, and my daughter, one of my girls, knows this guy, and then she met some people who know this guy, and she said to them, oh, yeah, yeah, he used to come to our church. And they said... He goes to church? That is not what you're looking for in your assessment. So pick a week. We'll send some investigators behind you, and then we'll stand you up here, stand me up here on a Sunday, and let them tell all. We found no record any comment, any, anything about God, Jesus, anything. No evidence. Certainly no upside down. You say, well, that's not my job. You know, you, 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 your life, you don't have to use words. I love this one. It's not about words, it's about your life. Okay, let's just go with our lives. What is it about my life? You know, people wearing all these masks. What is so cool is when you can spot a Christian in a mask. You look at him and go, you're a Christian, aren't you? You go, yes, sir. How'd you know that? Look at your eyes. You're on fire. Do our eyes say light? Jesus. No, I'm probably, I'm, I know I've lost a bunch of people out there. That's okay. And probably some in here too. Like, okay, I'm tired. Look, I, you know, I'm doing the best I can. I don't want to do all this. Just please leave me alone. I'll come back if you'll just go easier. And where are you going to end up? And how's the world going to end up? 
Now what I get excited about is the takers. Because every once in a while, one, two, three, Castro said all it would take is four. And he could do it all again. They'd have to be willing to die. Are you willing to lay your life down and turn the world upside down? Is he going to require that? Probably not. I don't think so. But if he did, you'd be okay with it. But you've got to be okay with it before you get to that moment. Amen. And you'd be amazed how many lost people there are in the world that are looking for a Jesus that has followers like he said he would have. Because they'll find a Bible, hotel room, they read it and go, well, I don't know any of these people. And then they meet one and go, wait a minute, this is something else. I want to be like that. Upside down. Let's, let's, let, let's not let the Marxists, the socialists, all the other crazies in the world do what we were left here, put here to do and be. Um, let's take them, Jesus. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these tremendous stories. We didn't even get to all of them about people who had made a decision to deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow you. And did it cost them everything? Yes, but look what we gain. Eternal life, abundant life, the impact that you attended in the, in the world, Lord. So help us be these people. And to get out of the way, we're Christians, then you live in us. Help us let you live through us. For anybody in the room or beyond, Lord, who goes, okay, I went in on that kind of Jesus. I'm a sinner, I get it. My life is screwed up. I've tried everything my way. Nothing works. Empty. Almost don't want to be here anymore. But I realize that this is the answer. Why I didn't see it or get it before, I don't know, but I'm ready. So God, I'm a sinner. I know I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead. With his own blood, he paid for my sin. And he's alive, and I want him alive in me. I accept the forgiveness of my sins. I accept the gift of eternal life that you bought and paid for with your own life. And I ask you to fill me, person of the Holy Spirit, fill my, my body, my life with you. And live not just in me, but live through me. And show me how to bring about this type of change, not only in my life, but in the world. And help me search the scriptures, read the scriptures, and see what it says and who it is that you want me to be and who it is that you are, and let you be that in and through me. Change my world and change the world through me, Lord, I pray. And Father, for those of us who are Christians, who have gone lukewarm, watered down, barely hanging on, and in some cases we'd probably just be better off in heaven and get on with it. But if we're still here, Lord, there's a reason. It is too easy for you to get us home. If we are here, help us see there is hope, there is mercy, there is grace, and that you are trying to get our attention and get us to turn to you and trust you and take a stand um, and, and speak the truth in love, but speak the truth and to be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within us. And yes, to live it out, but also to speak out when those opportunities come and they do come. Help there be enough evidence against us, Lord, that even in a court of law, we'd be, we'd be sentenced for being Christians. There's so much evidence. You're the best. Um, and it's, it is extraordinary to, to live by faith, Lord, to be patient to see you um, and to trust you. And yet... There just will there'll be nothing like seeing you. Uh, being pen pals is great, but man, to meet you and to see you and to bow before you and worship you in person. Wow. Help us long for that day, Lord, and realize that to be to live is Christ, but to die, that will be gain. So until that day, Lord, help us be faithful no matter what the cost, to point people to you. Um and we, we are so appreciative. We're so grateful. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, for those of you here or at home, uh, if you made a decision to accept the gift of eternal life, which is where it all starts, 
you're born once that gets you on the planet to get you into God's kingdom. You have to be born a second time spiritually. And uh, if you did that, you can just send us a little email, reunion at reunionchurch.org, and say, I got it. I trusted him. My whole life has changed. It's very encouraging for us to know that you're out there. You're just not as far out there as you were and uh, that you've made the biggest decision you ever make in your life. So please let us hear from you. Uh, it's very encouraging to us, and it gives us an opportunity to encourage you as well uh, along the way. Okay, we also normally... Uh, take up an offering and pass baskets, and that's gone. So for those of you in the room, we have receptacles in the back. Um, and you, if you have an offering there, if that's not how you want to do it, uh, a lot of people are using the website, reunionchurch.org, and on there there's a Contribute, a Give tab, and you can use that however you see fit. Um, and whoever left the credit card, uh, it ran out, so if you want to re replenish that, well, we need that replenished. So. Thank you for that. Boots, do I have anything from you? I guess not. Um, all right, so we're going to sing one, one more song uh, as, we, as we leave today. So, uh, again, be safe. And uh, a lot of people hurting out there, a lot of people lonely, a lot of people searching. This is a tremendous time. The fields are white into harvest and brown and yellow and red and whatever colors I left out, the harvest is ripe. So uh, let's, let's get to it.